Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am an Olympic junkie, and if I didn't have to be here for work, I wouldn't be here right now. That's not true. I would come and see Jerry in Georgia. <laughs> but really, this is a wonderful crowd uh, for an Olympic night. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, I'm Heather McClanahan, Executive Director of the Historical Society. We'd like to welcome you to our 2017-2018 lecture series, 100 Years on the Pajarito Plateau. Tonight we are going to be hearing about the history of land transfers and all kinds of other interesting ownership issues, and why our community looks the way it does. We also appreciate this year's lecture sponsor, and I'm going to introduce him now. Rafi Andonian and Nicole Kleber are our uh, sponsors, and Rafi is going to introduce our speakers this evening. G. Strickfadden and G. Strickfadden. <laughs> so Jerry and George Strickfadden um, are who I will be introducing for this spe uh, speech tonight. So Atomic City Tours owner, Georgia Strickfadden, was born and raised in Nuclear Age Los Alamos, and she launched her tour company in 1985. She and her husband Jerry, a retired engineer and also a native of Los Alamos, explored American West and researched Los Alamos history together. Tonight, they'll present a history of land transfers on the Pajarito Plateau. Please welcome Jerry and Georgia. Well, thank you to the Andonians for sponsoring this series. We appreciate that. And I appreciate you all here, too. Um, you know, we we're up against the Olympics and the county council meeting, and so <laughs> glad, glad you're here. Um, the, the whole thing about this um, working with the land transfers is that it's working with the land uh, that I've become part of. And I know that there were generations and other people uh, before me, way before me, that feel, felt the same way, feel the same way. But there's lots and lots of people who have owned this little remote corner of our earth and um, and had control over it. So the, the get the right buttons here. Here we go. Um, the plateau uh, makes it you know with the fingers of the plateau, the volcanic fingers, the result of the volcan volcanic eruption of the Hamas Mountains about 1.2 million years ago. Um, it makes each one of these fingers its own little place and. Even archaeologically, there were a lot of people that, uh, the people that came before, weren't necessarily even related to the, each other from one finger of the plateau to the next. I think they moved up and down. And I went to, I heard an archaeologist say this one time, and she was a young archaeologist, and I thought, you yeah, know, that's really true, because even in Los Alamos, we have good modes of transportation, and we go up and down. So, uh, the mesas. You know, we don't often cut across. And I, you know, I found that to be an interesting concept. So the, along onto this landscape came the European way of the influences of land ownership. Um, way back in 1523, the first Spanish law deeding, uh, to, deeding in quotes, to the Indians their own land and water, forests, and pastures. Okay, so they were being more organized in the European concept. And then in 1692, this was specifically applied to San Ildefonso Pueblo, Cochiti, and Santa Clara. Those are our neighbors. We share borders with them, and this is their ancestral areas. Um, and then according to Myra Ella Jenkins, uh, the state historian from years ago, uh, she found that the designation was one league from the church in the Pueblo to the four points of the compass. One league, I believe, is like three miles, okay? And even now, um, when you drive around in northern New Mexico especially, you will see um, if you drive from the Pueblo and keep going three miles, watch your odometer, and you're out of Indian land, and in, in, you're into non-Indian land a non-Indian settlement, or you've uh, bumped up against the boundaries of another Pueblo. So uh, that, that dates back to when the Spanish came and recognized 
uh, that the Pueblo people, the native peoples, were living on the land, had the rights to it, so they didn't, they weren't supposed to settle within one league of that. Um, so later, this system was confirmed by the Mexican law. So remember, Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821. So suddenly we're not talking about the Spanish Empire, we're talking about Mexican Empire, but the Mex Mexico used the same land ownership principles. Um, and then finally, bringing it up to our present day, it was confirmed by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, at the end of the Mexican-American Conflict War, 1848. That's still an important treaty, and I encourage you to go to the State History Museum if you don't want to go dig around in an archive somewhere, and they've got it. They've got it on a computer screen, the complete treaty, a photocopy of the real treaty with one column in English and one column in Spanish. And then they have it print, you know, printed out like in type in the next two columns, both Spanish and English. So you can search that treaty in yourself and confirm this. I did because I realized I was telling people this on tours and I'd never read the treaty. <laughs> so in the New History Museum I had read it and I was very glad to see that. And also they're not reservations, but corporations. Part of the Spanish system, Mexican system, were the land grants. Way back in 1742, it's still Spanish colonial empire, 1742, Pedro Sanchez from Santa Cruz, um, with his joint heirs, were granted what is now the White Rock area, kind of from uh, Morton Dodd Canyon down to Frijoles Canyon. You know, that would have been the, the Sanchez and his heirs. Later, uh, you know, quite a bit later in 1851, Antonio Sanchez sold the grant to Ramon Vigil from Santa Clara. Um, and then it was Ramon Vigil who was one of the first ones under the new territorial law, under U.S. law, to present himself with his, um, what some scholars think is a bogus uh, land grant, and get it confirmed. And it was confirmed in 1860 by the U.S. Congress. So they had to go through and confirm all these land grants. And there, you, you know there were shenanigans going on. But as I say on the slide here, the scholars today think it is forged. Uh, but the name still stays with the history of land grants. I looked and looked for the map I saw just two months ago. Um, it's a county map that shows uh, White Rock, but shaded in the background, it says Ramon B. Hill. So it's still known as the Ramon B. Hill grant. So if any of you have that, I see somebody nodding like you. If you have a copy of that, I would love to get that. I looked all over. Uh, and all the sources I could find in the county that was not successful. But here is a, a schematic of it. This is 1912 uh, or 16, 17. It was right. Um, it was, uh, this is a second, there's an earlier one that's similar to this, but this is 1916 or so. And notice along the top border, and some of you may be, get my pointer out. Um, Right along here, see these squares? They've already um, surveyed it for townships, and of course they did back in the 1880s. Town, uh, north of the Ramon V Hill is where we are, and this was homesteaded lands. Uh, one more land grant that we got to talk about that borders us anyway, and that is meaningful to us is the Baca location number one, the Bias Caldera. It was a trade for disputed land grant in Las Vegas, New Mexico. And there's a lot that we can say about that, but just so you know what drove that. In 1860, Congress approved that land grant. Early in the early 1900s, it was sold from the, well, heirs and the lawyers of the um, family, the Baca, Baca, of course, uh, from the Baca family to the 
land, the sheep baron Frank Bond, and it became the center of his sheep empire that was scattered throughout the nation. <clears throat> and, well, quite far reaching. After World War II, uh, wool plummeted, sheep went out of favor, and the um, heirs, the Frank, the Frank Bond heirs sold the ranch to the Dunnigans, Texas Cattle Company, who were going to develop it, but then, but then re realized the value of it ecologically. And then in 2000, we know that it was sold to the U.S. government. So there was the last transfer, and it's now Vice Caldera National Preserve. Okay, I started to talk about the homesteads in the 1880s through 1943. The Pajarito Plateau north of the Ramon Vigil Grant was homesteaded. Um, unclaimed lands in the Hamas area under federal administration had been already surveyed in 1857, 1876. Those are kind of key surveys, but there were other surveys as well. So um, those, I just mentioned those surveys because Dorothy Horde mentioned them and I found them very interesting in her book. Uh, it's a lab publication about the transportation system in the Hamas, in the Pajarito Plateau. Anyway, the Homestead Act of 1862, it's been amended and changed uh, in subsequent years, but in 1862, essentially what it is is you file to enter a claim of like 160 acres if you're out on the plains, but here on the plateau often much smaller than that. And then you work the land for five years, you build a house with one door and one window. So they don't want you to just go pitch a tent for five years and suddenly get free land. Um, and then that's called proving up and they would get a patent or a deed. So basically a quick run on that on what is a homestead. Uh, there were about 40 patented homesteads by the time World War II came along. Some of those had been absorbed with each other. And the area was acquired by the U.S. Army for, during World War II for the war effort. But before we pass this on to Jerry, this is, that, this is the photo that's out on this plaque out here by uh, the Romero cabin. The various homesteads are outlined, and you can see they're irregular. Some are contiguous, uh, but let's see, where we're, <laughs> we're in the middle of all this. We're right up in here, right where that is. So you can see that the ranch school, and uh, keep that in mind when we talk about the, when Jerry talks about the federal government getting the land, there were just about as many homesteads to the north of Los Alamos homestead, homestead, Los Alamos Ranch, as there were to the south. It was in the big middle of everything and had a fantastic facility. Um, now, the homesteaders, once you've proved up your homestead, you own it and you can sell it. So they're bought and sold, and I found this to be something that Sharon found for me um, on newspapers.com. And it's from the Santa Fe, New Mexican, 1917. And I, the key things I pulled out, the title right up here says, Brooke, who built the first silo in the state, quits ranch for a county agent job. So this is the announcement of the sale of Los Alamos Ranch to, down here, last month, Mr. Brooke sold the ranch and part of the cattle to Ashley Pond, who intends to develop a play, the place as an outdoor school for boys. It did not fit on the screen. But, um, and I also called out here that he had sh uh, sheep and Herefords, Herefords. So he had sold the ranch, and that's pertinent to us because we're sitting on that right now. Um, most of the farms were really interesting. You know, they were, were not as fancy as Los Alamos Ranch, but this is, this cabin is still there on North Mesa. It's being used as a hay barn on North Mesa stable area. These were the outbuildings. Uh, this particular homestead era, area in 1946 was uh, 
entrepreneurial cowboy named J. Kirkpatrick got a um, concession from the federal government, from the army, to run a riding stable. So that was the beginning of horses on North Mesa. And that evolved around until the people who have horses on North Mesa now are on land that was quit deeded to the county of Los Alamos, who still runs it like the Atomic Energy Commission had with the same individual uh, agreement between now with the county. And uh, this is an ironclad group, uh, pretty much. <laughs> now, we've worked at that through the years. Okay, so Jerry's going to move in and tell you about the Corps of Engineers. Well, this is a, sort of a strange little cartoon I put together here. Um, homesteading, as Georgia said, started in the, uh, in the late 1800s. In fact, I think 1897 is the, is the date. And uh, it proceeded along for uh, quite a few years. And that's a dotted line because we haven't heard Judy Machen's talk yet. This is actually a series, a planned series that sort of got out of sync. And uh, Judy's going to tell us everything and, and turn that into a solid line, which we have over here because Sharon Snyder has talked about the ranch school. And of course, some of these homesteads were aggregated into a big ranch, into the Brock Brook Ranch Farm, and they were sold and became the nucleus for the Los Alamos Ranch School in 1917. But both of these stories come to the same end the last few days of 1942 and the first few days of 1943. Everything came to a dead halt. The agency that caused that to happen is, was the Albuquerque District of the Army Corps of Engineers. And they did it with the help of the Second War Powers Act. There were two War Powers Act during World War II, the first one and the second one, surprise. Um, only the Second War Powers Act from uh, March 42 allows condemnation and taking of property. The guy who was the point man for that effort was the Under Secretary of War, and he had to issue a direction to acquire land. This is a direction to a federal agency. I'm sure that it was a Corps of Engineers in most cases, but uh, he had to issue this um, for for the Pajarito Plateau uh, in November 1942, he directed the Corps to uh, put together 4,500 acres of federal land and almost 9,000 acres of private land. What did I say? For, yeah, sorry, 45,000 acres and 8,900 acres. Units are just terrible. Um, of private land. If you're familiar with the numbers, that 8,900 is about uh, two and a half times as much private land as was actually taken. And I think, in fact, that issue of taking private land caused the, caused the boundaries to be redrawn and, uh, and, and, the, and the size of the project reduced to a degree. Although I don't have any evidence of that. But in this direction to acquire land, there are many, many, many names listed, uh, many more than uh, uh, holdings that were purchased eventually. So for federal land, it's pretty straightforward. You just negotiate with the other agency and they, if they want to grant you access. Uh, that happened very quickly up here in Los Alamos. Uh, in April 43, the, the uh, Forest Service granted uh, 45,000 acres to the Corps of Engineers. To do it to private land, uh, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated. Um, the agency, the gaining agency, um, has to petition in condemnation to the U.S. District Court, you know, why they want the land and what the extent of the, uh, of the taking is. The court uh, has to issue an order of possession to the owner. Um, if the wheels are greased, this can happen very quickly, uh, almost instantaneously. And once this order is, is uh, issued, uh, the, the U.S. government owns the land. Um, it was done up here in five stages. The private land was divvied up into five areas, and uh, they went sort of working out from here uh, and, and issued these, uh, 
petition and condemnation to, to get five zones of private land, some of which contain private land. Um, then once the order of possession is issued, then you can sort of take your time and issue a declaration of taking, and that has to include an appraisal. The government's side of it, here's what we think your, your property is worth. Um, negotiation can occur, and uh, there are appeals all the way going up to uh, court cases. Now this, this is a very strange situation, and I wonder if my battery's dying. Okay, the PA's not working very well, is it? <laughs> I, think, I think the battery's about done for. So I'll try to speak up. Okay, I'll use the mic and I'll speak up. Um, okay, so in a, in a uh, Corps of Engineers document, um, they're, they are confident enough that this is either in control or has, been, has happened to, by mid-1944, claim that, the, that the, all the land had been acquired successfully. Um, there seems to be, however, a, a large number of court cases related to these takings uh, that persisted for several years. So that's something that needs to be unfolded by a diligent researcher. Okay, George just showed you a picture of uh, the Luhan cabin, the Luhan homestead on North Mesa. Um, I wanted to find a, uh, a, a photo where the, this label down here was legible because it's not in, in that one you saw. Okay. <laughs> so I went to the marvelous archives of the Historical Society and I found this neat picture. Um, it was taken on December 30th, 1942, and so the uh, contract has been let uh, about three weeks earlier for the contractor, the Sun Corporation, to come up here and start work on Site Y. So these guys must be Sun employees starting the construction of Site Y. And I don't know exactly what they're doing, but there are nine guys, and one guy's got his hand in his pocket, so it's a construction crew. <laughs> no, no, notice that uh, there's not much more snow there in December, the end of December 1942, uh, than there is right now. So uh, warm, dry winters are not all in, unusual here. Um, as is the case with most of these pictures, somebody has handwritten a, a building number there, T5. And we know from looking at a 1943 map that T5 was located basically behind where C.B. Fox is now. This looks, this looks serious. Todd's going to do something. Excuse us for a minute. Okay, Un unaided here. I just thought that was a neat picture because it shows land transfer in action. You've got the old, the old structure, uh, the landowner is gone, and the Corps of Engineers and their contractors have moved in to, to start work anew. Uh, now I wanna, oh, hmm, sorry. This is not exactly the same version of the talk we left home with. Like this. So, right. It's a long story. Um, so, down near Alamogordo, uh, the Corps of Engineers built an airbase, a fairly ordinary airbase. Um, but right next to it, as part of the same project, they built a huge bombing and gunnery range. Not surprisingly, the Al Alamogordo Bombing and Gunnery Range. Uh, as you can see, it's quite large, essentially 2,000 square miles compared to the 77 square miles that were taken here. Uh, there are about three times as many private holdings. That's a pretty loose number. And then this is a really loose number. Uh, about 7% of the, of the land taken on the Pajarito Plateau for Site Y was private. Okay. It's working just about like it was before we got new batteries. <laughs> 
it sounds like. Okay, anyway, um, and about uh, less than 2% was private at the bombing and gunnery range. Uh, but what's interesting is the different approaches. Uh, the, uh, the Corps of Engineers tried to lease the land, the private land, on the bombing and gunnery range. Uh, legend has it that's because they intended to return the property. Uh, but I noticed from comparing notes that they didn't have the second uh, War Powers Act to do it any other way at that point. So uh, I'm not sure if that legend is correct. But anyway, they couldn't take land by condemnation at that point. And so they tried to lease it. Well, that turns out to be really hard to do. You can, you can legally take land but you can't legally put a pen in somebody's hand and make them sign a lease. And there was a lot of objection uh, to, to this uh, assault on, on ownership. Uh, these people got a really bad deal. They were run off of their land, which was their livelihood. They were promised a monthly check, but the check was always way, way late. They didn't have a check in their hand to go buy a new place or to lease a new place. Plus, between the bombing range and the air base, thousands of people were showing up renting every available bed. And so the people that were displaced here just, just really got it, got a bad, a bad deal. Um, also, there was a little bit of trade involved. There was some state land involved uh, in, the, in the land that became the, the bombing and gunnery range. Um, I think it was the, probably the, uh, the right of way for a state highway that went through there. That was quickly dealt with by trading. Uh, in, in contrast, uh, now the Second War Powers Act is in effect, and the, uh, so the same group of engineers came here and just bought the land. Uh, one of the interesting issues that is in, is in uh, common to the two is people who didn't want to give up their land um, waived their grazing lease with the federal government and said, this paper gives me right to access this land, you can't throw me off. And so the, uh, the Corps had to actually go to the White House and get an executive order signed that would let them summarily uh, terminate grazing leases. And that same uh, issue was invoked preemptively here. Uh, when they showed up, they terminated the grazing leases, leases first thing. Um, on the Pajarito Plateau, people with grazing leases were reimbursed per head on the grazing lease uh, for losing the, the lease. Um, and I don't know if that happened at Alamogordo or not. What happened at Alamogordo? Okay, well, the, I put it up there as an example, but Georgia says I'm supposed to remind you that Trinity site, which the, Corvin, the, the Manhattan District took over and used to test the first atomic explosive, um, was a corner of the Alamogordo bombing and gunnery range. So there is, there is a tie. Okay, th this slide could be entitled uh, Jerry's Big Surprise. Um, for, for the longest time, I have thought that the outline of Los Alamos County was essentially the same as the outline for Site Y, for the Manhattan Project site. When, in researching this, when I finally got documents and maps together and started looking, that turns out not to be true. Uh, the, the, this is just a map I grabbed off the internet, and I cropped the top so you could see the bottom part really well. So this is the southern end of, of Los Alamos County, this dark black line you can see here. It turns out the boundary of the, of the Manhattan Project site is this yellow line sort of follows State Road 4 and then follows Water Canyon and then it stops at the Santa Fe County line. Well, <laughs> that's a big difference. It turns out, because the Historical Society published a great book by uh, uh, Mrs. Chambers, um, that I learned that in late 47 and early 48, in two stages, uh, the AEC secured land, 20,000 acres, uh, to, to provide housing and additional laboratory space up here. And I think that's all of the land between the current boundary and the yellow boundary. Certainly it includes White Rock, Lacenda, Pajarito Acres, TA-33, TA-39, TA-49. 
all those places are outside of what the Manhattan Project owned. Is this my slide or your slide? <laughs> okay. was used during the war, though. Nope. It was. I thought it was too, but it was outside the. It, 33 was outside the boundary. Okay, but it was. It was the area used? I believe not. Okay, I'll try and talk. Can you hear me? Okay. Because I, you know, I was a PE teacher one time, and I can talk pretty loud. Um, so, uh, do you recognize this? Okay, there's the pond, and the photo was taken from the south, looking towards the north. All of this area out here uh, later became um, north. The golf course and north community was over here, and then off uh, was western area. But those were uh, the only developed parts during Manhattan Project were close, close to the pond. And can you see those dark buildings mm -hmm. surrounding it? Those are the tech areas before they put the asbestos on the side. So the tech area of the Manhattan Project is here, and these are all houses. So the laboratory and the town kind of were mushed in together and intertwined and were thought of as one thing. Uh, there Uh, there were great uncertainties after World War II, whether the, there would be continued research here. Um, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the uh, director of the Site Y and, well, we just say Manhattan Project up here, um, he departed in October of 1945, but he wasn't the only one. There were a bunch of the people who had come during World War II. By the way, by the end of the war, total population up here was around 7,000, not the couple of hundred they were going to move into the ranch. So um, I have another graph that shows that they were hiring at the rate of 100 people per month throughout the dur duration of the war here at Los Alamos. And that's why all that temporary housing had to be built. Um, so anyway, J. Robert Oppenheimer, after the war, left along with a bunch of other people. Norris Bradbury was appointed director, um, and he thought for just six months, and then they would be closing the operation down here, moving things elsewhere. Um, the uh, Project Crossroads was a Navy operation, but Los Alamos lab uh, provided the, the bombs <laughs> that they used, the, all the technical stuff. And Bradbury was struggling to keep staff here with no, not much mission, and things were in flux. So we're a year and a half after the war. Um, but even, the, even with that, if they were gonna have permanent people come, they had to have some permanent like housing. And so in 1946, General Groves um, got the first housing built in its western area. So that is post-World War II, but it is still <laughs> technically Manhattan Project because Atomic Energy Commission was not created yet. So the McMahon bill, Washington had to step forward and make some decisions about what was going to go on here, um, if there was going to be anything going on here. So the McMahon bill uh, took the area, took everything that was Manhattan Project out of Army hands and put it under this totally civilian agency, the Atomic Energy Commission. So by mid, around, I think we've got the photos from in our archives, the mid uh, July 1947, the, the formal change of command, the Army marches in and like hands over the keys to the civilian guard force. And so there's, there, there was a real ceremony for that. So we, at that point, we've got people Americans living here, they want to vote. And this is part of Sandoval County. And in fact, I was born here in 1948 in the old Army Hospital, just about 100 yards from where we are. And my birth certificate says I was born in Sandoval County, Los Alamos. So, but not P.O. Box, I'm not a P.O. Box person. And I was born in Sandoval County. Uh, the, so there was great wondering of 
what was state jurisdiction and federal jurisdiction and um, how are people going to vote? Precinct 17, their political machinery in Sandoval County was pretty balanced. They knew what was what, and all of a sudden, here's this uh, new place up over here with people that aren't part of that cultural balance. And so they, you know, they didn't care. <laughs> they didn't want us want people up here voting particularly. Um, so there were about 45,700 acres that were Atomic Energy Commission and 3,600 acres of private land uh, that had been condemned that Jerry just told you about. You notice our research turns up slightly different numbers, but they're close, you know, they're in the neighborhood. Um, and there were other 60 acres of other government agencies, whether it was state or Indian land. Um, so anyway, the New Mexico voting and other civil rights seemed to be suspended up here, and it was a threat to have us in Sandoval County. If you read Marjorie Bell Chambers' book, which they've got it, uh, I think they've got some of these books back for sale in the back. I really recommend them. But so finally, the state of New Mexico um, passed legislation to form a new county out of what was mostly had been Manhattan Project over here on this side of the mountains from the rest of Sandoval County. And the, so on June 10th, 1949, suddenly we are a civilian political entity. However, nobody owned any property. <laughs> you know, there was no real estate ownership here. Everything was built was being built new, and it all belonged to the Atomic Energy Commission. If you lived in Los Alamos before the late 1950s, you did not own your house. You rented from the government. Um, here is, a, again, a picture, another photo. Here's the, all of Los Alamos County. Can you guys see that green line yes. going around here? Um, and then here's the Vice Caldera. Bandelier National Monument is down in here. So there's our county, and most of this lighter colored uh, area here is the development, like laboratory and the town of Los Alamos. Just, you know, sometimes it's nice to have a visual of that. Oh, and let me go back. Uh, so White Rock is right over here on the tip. And here's the Rio Grande. Um, now, the AEC, kind of early on, 1949, with the Scurry panel, started making plans or making it possible to transfer or dispose of the civilian communities that had grown up as part of the Manhattan Project in um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Hanford, Washington, Richland, the Tri-Cities area of Pasco and Kennewick, um, and at Los Alamos. So in 1951, Richland, Washington, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee were sold uh, to, you know, just the wartime buildings were sold, the wartime housing. But things were different in Los Alamos. You saw that picture of the tech area being like part of the town and everybody was mushed together and they couldn't really let go of that land um, and those houses. And also Bradbury looked ahead and realized that, okay, so if we have an attrition of people that retire and we have this limited housing and they own it, we can't boot them out. You know, we're gonna have less and less housing. So they decided to wait in Los Alamos until the tech area was totally removed from the middle of town. For 20 years, the tech area was just right over here around Ashley Pond and extended over to the edge of the canyons. So that had to be rectified by building a whole new laboratory over where we find it today. So the, there's not much over at the current laboratory that was here during World War II. The World War II lab and for 20 years late after that was around the pond, so it definitely dominated the town. Oh, that. 
So um, the need for housing uh, was desperate. The AEC disposed of Bronca Mesa in 1958, and then White Rock, 1960 and following, and then Pajarito Acres, do I have the date right? <laughs> okay, John wrote a book about, John Ramsey, raise your hand. Okay, he wrote, he wrote the book about the, how they managed to get Pajarito Acres, and it's a really fascinating story. So that's for sale in the back, I recommend it. <laughs> Um, the government built housing and buildings, businesses, anything that was left standing that hadn't been sold as surplus was transferred to whoever was living in it. So each building was appraised, each individual house was appraised. And I know that because my uncle was one of the appraisers. And he came up, he was an FHA appraiser, and he came up to Los Alamos, and he was a favorite uncle, so I always liked it when he came, because he'd have lunch with us or something. And it was fun. Uh, but anyway, he came up several times throughout a number of years, over a span of years, appraising housing, appraising businesses, because you know the community center, now Central Park Square had to be sold, and everything you know, was transferring either to the county of Los Alamos or to um, individuals. So with all that sale and suddenly there's private property and their government's trying to get, get rid of the community. You know, they don't want to operate a community, they want to operate a laboratory. And that's their mission. And so in all this transitioning, there's a lot of utilities and things that government, that the county was starting to take over, and if they were gonna take, you know, be receiving money, selling real estate, whatever, they had to be incorporated. So Los Alamos County Incorporated in 1969. Um, now, in the 70s, in the meantime, also, um, AC, AEC transitioned to Energy Research and Development Administration for a short time, and that morphed into the Department of Energy. So that's what we know today with, that runs the lab and owns any parcels that haven't yet been transferred. And there are some um, that, were, that still need to be transferred. So sort of a very nutshell of these transfers, North Mesa and Bronca Mesa in the 70s and 80s, the Department of Energy, Los Alamos site office down behind the high school, hospital rather, behind the hospital is just is now transferred and plans are being made to build um, some housing units there, probably more clustered. Um, and then there's a large tract north of Bronca Mesa uh, that is where the shooting range is and everybody likes to ride their horses and go hiking and mountain biking that still needs to be transferred. But it seems like every time it comes up, it's like they don't like the plan because the political will right now is that we kind of like our open spaces and don't want to be built everywhere. Um, but so no matter where you stand on that issue, keep an eye on it because it's going to come. It's going to happen. And then also DP Mesa uh, will soon be transferred. Uh, that's the old DP site uh, going out straight behind Smith's Marketplace. So there, there are other smaller parcels that have transferred, probably will. So what took 70, it's taking us 70, 75 years to get the land back after just a few months of being taken over for the emergency of World War II. I always find this kind of interesting. So. That brings us up to any questions or um, any, or if you want to leave, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> but Jerry and I can answer questions. Let, let me give you your, the microphone so people can hear you. In as much as this was a secret project up here, what were the homesteaders and other parties that were on the land, what were they told um, so far as their land being taken away from them uh, and, and acquired? The, the cover uh, story was a demolition range. 
that everything was a demolition from yeah, Don no. Gordo to no, 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 no. Just, just the site Y up here. I mean, the, the people that had, had their land taken for air bases, people that had their land taken for air bases knew it was an air base. I mean, that was pretty obvious. This was probably the only place in New Mexico where the purpose was was covered uh, and classified. And maybe part of your question, well, what did people, what were people told? First of all, let's go back to World War II. The nation is locked in a desperate war. At, in 1942-43, we are not winning that war. And people are, um, you know, they're, they want to do the part, their part as a patriotic American. But they, they do wonder. My mother was in Santa Fe during that time. My dad was in the Army Air Forces during World War II, serving in both Europe and the South Pacific. And when the war finally ended, he finally got back to Santa Fe and needing a job. And this is where the jobs were. So anyway, uh, my mom always said, oh, I knew they were making atomic bombs, and I wish they'd hurry to get this war <laughs> over. Well, she was from Kansas, and she talked like President Truman. So. <laughs> so, she didn't use those words. More questions? In the original boundary for the uh, Manhattan Project, the eastern boundary of the Manhattan area was straight north and south. When Los Alamos County came into existence, the eastern boundary has a dagger-like projection going in. How did that come about then? There's the dagger. Yeah. And, uh, That's, that uh, little dagger thing is um, is San Ildefonso Pueblo. Uh, since that map you saw of the, the Ramon de Hill grant, uh, they apparently made a claim and they got that much. And that that vertical line is the Santa Fe County uh, County line. And it, it continues down here. I just didn't I just didn't draw it. You can see, you can see it down here. In your uh, Alamogordo base, so in the back. on the Alamogordo base, there was a gentleman who, re in, when the leases were beginning to run out, and in, uh, in, I believe it was even in the 60s, stood off the U.S. government with a shotgun, and it makes, I think there's a full book written on it, but he stood them off completely, and they were just absolutely helpless in trying to get, get him off his land. There are a lot of stories like that associated with that bombing and gunnery range. It's a little bit hard to tell what's what's really right. Um, apparently, the army sort of despaired of getting everybody off. They tried and tried and tried, and and finally just told everybody they could find, "Hey, you know, we're dropping live bombs. You know, it's it's your responsibility." Okay. And so there were people on the on the bombing and gunnery range for the whole war. Um, and I've even read that there were parts of the bombing and gunnery range they didn't use, that the military did not use, because they knew there were civilians there. So, like I say, those people were really in a bind. Uh, where else could they go? Well, yeah, there's there's a little bit of that too. He he said ornery. I heard at one time the little dagger that the Indians owned was still Sandoval County. Do you know if that's still true, or? Georgia, that, that little yes. piece, that, yes. that is Sandoval County, yeah. Yes. So that line shouldn't be there, that little black line. Yeah, this, this, little, this little black line shouldn't be here. No, it should be, it should be here. Because this is Santa Fe County, that's Sandoval County. That's Santa Fe County. So since Los Alamos, since they condemned the Red School in order to purchase it, there must have been some negotiations that went on before. And so what did they end up paying for the prior property? Yeah, the, the Red School was a little different. I just glossed that over for time. Uh, there's nothing 
in the War Powers Act that prevents the federal agency from just going to a landowner and negotiating to buy it. And I believe that's what happened to the ranch school. Uh, they agreed very quickly. Uh, they gave the government a right of access in November of 42. And so that's why the government could come in here and start on the laboratory. Uh, they also worked out a deal where the school continued on a really abbreviated uh, semester. They stayed for Christmas break and, and worked hard and finally graduated in what was it, mid February? January. 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 End of January. End of January. January 28th. <laughs> So, so yeah, the school the school was a uh, was a little bit different um, in that they they I you know again that era is still a little bit confusing to me, but I believe that they did not condemn the ranch school. But do you think they somebody paid? Yeah, because you, you asked you asked how much. I I think the number was four hundred and forty thousand dollars for the ranch school in nineteen forty three. That's big bucks. It was a it was a really nice facility. I I have trouble getting that point across to tourists um, on the van because somehow they think it was a Boy Scout camp and was only used part of the year. But it was used year round. They had over fifty buildings. This was one of fifty buildings. This was the grandest, but they had the big house, but they had some other cabins. You saw that one being uh, moved or whatever was going on with it. So it was a really nice upscale facility they also had electricity up here <laughs> i've often wondered where the big house was located to fuller lodge the big house was maybe a hundred yards that way there is a photograph of it, if you guys haven't seen it yet, a large photo that the landowner, uh, Koonsberg, uh, put on the wall in recognition last year of the founding of the ranch school, 100th anniversary, the founding of the ranch school, which was 1917. So it was over there, but it was torn, it was used throughout the war and then torn down to make way for the shopping center, the community center. What date does the laboratory use as its beginning date? The, the beginning date? A April 1st. <laughs> yeah, they, the people moved in, so they spent three months building the tech area around the pond, and then they uh, had enough built that they could move in uh, the first person out, the first couple of hundred people moved in and filled up the ranch buildings right away. So there was this big building boom. But they got, um, Charlotte Serber in her account of it said that it was not ready to open any time. <laughs> they kept, because they kept building it and all families appeared. Oh no, no school. Okay, build the school. So. You know, it was, they were inventing Los Alamos as they went along. And then they reinvented it after the war under the Atomic Energy Commission. Yeah, I have two questions. Well, one is, one is a story and one is a question. Oh, the, first, the question is, when I remember the old maps, there were a lot of parcels of bandolier that were in Pueblo Bayo Canyon. And I'm wondering what happened to those. And then the second one is a story I heard. Maybe you can confirm whether or not it's true. And that is the family that lived at the top of Rendia Canyon um, would not leave. They had a house over there. One day they went to a funeral. When they got back, their house was burned down and they were forced out. Have you ever heard that story? Is that apocryphal? I have not heard that story. The people at the head of, of Rendia Canyon were the Grants, and that cabin still exists, and it got moved in 1958 up to North Mesa and became a barn at the stables. I have never heard of a place being burned down. To keep their people out, because they wouldn't leave. Yeah. That was the story I heard, and, and hmm. I think it was uh, a story that had been told to me by one of the, the land grants 
homestead. Uh, I, I don't know. Okay. Probably a home, yeah, they were homesteaders. Okay. But what about Mandalier? Okay, yes, down there, Otoe ruin and, and little Otoe there. Um, Bandelier is keeping them safe, but it, uh, it's actually on Indian land. Okay, that's my understanding. Does anybody know anything more specific than that? The ruins down in the canyon were transferred from the government 30 years ago or so. 30 years ago or so were transferred from a, uh, Department of Energy to the Pueblo of San Ildefonso. Okay. No, I won't guarantee it. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be sent out, sent out the console. Any, any more questions? It's kind of hot in here. I know you guys. Are. <laughs> I'd be sleeping if I were you. I came in 1959, and does anyone remember house hopping based upon uh, laboratory salary? Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I, you know, I, in my, some of the talks I give to, like, uh, leadership Los Alamos and this type of thing. I, my family got into a western area house when I was just five years old. So that was in about 1952 or so. And um, we stayed. So that's my experience. <laughs> but then somebody came up and said, my mother said we moved every weekend. The women had it all together. Because <laughs> they were jockeying around to get into the house. And she said they, they had a bunch of friends and you know everybody would get up, pack the kitchen and get that all ready and all the other furniture would arrive and they were able to feed everybody dinner that night in the new place. And they were helping each other jockey around, but you guys seem to know more. We had four. We were in four government houses before we went to Barbara Wagers. Barbara might come to five, but I I've heard that too, but that's not my experience. Well, one of the interesting things that I heard was at a museum conference actually years ago, and a professor of history from Texas, one of the, I think he was in Denton, Texas, said, well, while Los Alamos was fighting the Cold War, it was living under one of the most socialized systems anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite true. <laughs> so, are there, if there are no other questions, feel free, just a second, Jerry's gonna say something. You know, regarding the, the living conditions up here when the AEC on the town, um, I claim there are millions of people in this country that were lived and raised under the same conditions. It was just like being on a military base. Same thing, you know, government ownership, uh, you know, the rules were about the same. The AEC was all military, right? They were just military people that retired and, and took over the AEC. <laughs> So I don't think there was anything that extraordinary about, about being up here. So anyway, I, I think we've moved in the right direction in our town and we get to own houses, we get to own, own property, we get to accept in people who don't work here. Now they get to come. So um, thank you all for coming. Oh. <laughs>